says, my name is David Bender. The talk is yet another talk about security and best practices. And the reason why it is yet another talk about security is because pretty much every single year, somebody talks about security, somebody gets up and talks about it. So why am I talking about it again? Well, the reason being security is constantly evolving. It's constantly changing. And you have all the concerns that you've always had from the previous years. So go back and look at the videos from the last 15 years from when anybody has spoken. You have a lot from Nir Simenyevich speaking his talks. You have a lot from uh, Nir You have a lot of talks from Eric Klein speaking about it. He spoke about it earlier. He did a wonderful talk about how what people are doing once they compromise systems. This is in addition, but it's sort of like a game of whack-a-mole where attackers will go ahead and compromise the system in one way. You'll figure out how they got in. You'll try to shut it down. They'll come back. But it's ever evolving. So why am I talking about security? I try to find something new and interesting. This year I sent out an email to my staff. I sent out an email to some of my uh, fun resellers that I love working with. And I said, oh, I signed up to speak, but now I have to find the topic. So one of the resellers that gives me the most grief when it comes to security said, talk about security. It's a passion. It is a passion, but with him it's more of a passion because it's a constant love-hate relationship. As a reseller and as a salesperson, what they love to do is sell. And anything that us engineers do that make their lives a little bit harder, but that's going to secure the system so it makes it easier for us to operate so we don't get woken up at 3 o'clock in the morning when there's a problem. We don't like that because we like sleeping at night, but they like sleeping at night in their comfortable beds from all the money they're making. So it's a constant back and forth. So like I said, the topic's been talked about a lot. I have a little bit to add on what's been going on lately, but you have to constantly be vigilant on what's going on. Who here has been hit by fraud in the past? All right. Do you know how they got into your system and how they, they broke in? Anybody want to volunteer? Want to volunteer? How did they get in? They found my Vizhnik server and downloaded uh, the files for the old model to support the um, Exactly what I'm, so that, that, that I'll, I'll get to that in a minute, but yeah, that's exactly, that's where they're, they're concentrating a lot of their efforts on right now. And if I would have turned this on, it would work, my clicker. There we go, so a little bit about my company. This really hasn't changed. It started in 2006, we started small. We were doing primarily hosted PBX, started doing a lot more um, hosted, got into high-end SIP trunking, and I say high-end because here in the United States, it's not that hard to do calls. Most of the times you make a call and it works. When it comes into international, it's a completely different animal. It's, it becomes a lot bigger of a pain, a lot more fun, a lot more money to be had, but then as an engineer, a lot bigger headaches. We, have, we do um, register here in the United States with the FCC. We have the equivalent of a sea like in Cyprus, in Israel, yada, yada. All right, so what is, the big, what is the big threat? And not necessarily just about attacks on phone systems, but when people hear fraud and, and, and attacking and security, what are we talking about? So we have the usual, we have the script kiddies. We have people that think that they're attackers. And I say attackers, not hackers. I have one client that gets very, very insulted when I loosely use the word hackers because he says hackers are good people. It's attackers and the fraudsters that are bad people. So if I say hacker, please correct me because if he watches this, I'm going to be in trouble. So. You have, the, you have the script kiddies. <coughs> I apologize in advance for the talking. Whenever I come here, I seem to get sick. There's so many parties going around. It's a lot of fun. You just have to know where to go. Um, so you have the script kiddies. You have the kids that think that they're attackers. They're going around. They're looking to find vulnerable systems. Not necessarily hitting you because you have a PBX, but just because they're looking for the lulls. They're looking to have fun. So in fact, uh, we use failed pen. I'll get into that in a bit where most of the uh, attacks that are hitting our web server, they're looking for PHP my admin, they're looking for WordPress installations, they're looking for just any system they could compromise, either to have fun, or they think there's something deeper, they think there's possibly a payment system where they could get credit card information, or they could compromise your host and then use it for other attacks. We see primarily most of these scans are coming from either Eastern Europe or they're coming from China, and a little bit uh, lately from Russia. I don't care too much about these because it's, I have a dictionary of these. I shouldn't say I don't care. I do care. But for the most part, when the script kiddies come in, I know I don't have PHP my admin. I don't have WordPress in most of this junk. As soon as we get any such requests, we shut it down. Then we have espionage and the like. Think of a messy divorce or the CEO scam. Who here knows what the CEO scam is? 
So the CEO scam is, is basically in, in my wife's company. They almost got lit up for it. So basically what happens is, is they'll, I think they have a large organization, like the company that my wife works for is an electronics company. So what they'll do is, and they're doing a lot of wires, they're sending a lot of money to China, they're sending a lot of money overseas, they could send 50,000, 100,000, 200,000 dollars in, in one wire without thinking twice about it. If they could get into one person's email address and they know who is the CEO, they know who's close to the CEO, the person calling the shots, the person that's saying where to send the money, they'll go ahead and falsify the email address because it's not that hard to falsify source email addresses. We know it's not that hard to falsify caller ID. They'll send an email to somebody in finance that just looks at an email, doesn't actually look to see. I mean, these guys are really lazy. They don't even go ahead and, 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 and make the email just look like it's coming from the CEO. They'll just put the CEO's name in there. And for us engineers, if we actually look at the view source, you'll see it's not coming from the company, but Sally in the accounting department doesn't know better, and she's gonna go ahead and wire out the money. And then they'll only catch it through an audit, and she'll say the CEO told me to send the money, or whoever it is that's responsible for sending the money will send it. So if you Google CEO scam, it is becoming a bigger and bigger of a problem. So as an example, if you're a phone company and you know primarily all your calls are on net. So if customer A is calling customer B, or if you're running a phone system and you know that your phone, all the calls are located into this PBX. You don't have multiple branches. So if you have multiple branches, each branch has its own set of phone numbers. There's no reason why anybody should be going ahead and calling your PBX with one of the numbers that are on it off net. Right away, there's a red flag. But if somebody spoofs caller ID, you're not watching, you're not looking out to see, hey, are any of the calls coming into my system with my own phone numbers? And then again, poor old Sally in accounting, sorry for picking on her, but she gets a phone call and it looks like it was somebody in the company that she doesn't know, but somebody that's gonna be good at convincing her to send the money, she's not gonna know any better. And then primarily telecom fraud, which is primarily what I'm talking about, where we have most of the problems. So I mentioned earlier here in the United States, well, how many people here from the US? Okay, most of you and how many people are here not from the US or Canada, because Canada, well, it's North America. All right, so here in the US when it comes to making phone calls, wholesale is generally less than half a cent a minute. There, there, is, there is fraud here, even here in the United States, but for the most part, it's not really costing you a lot of money. There usually aren't a lot of red flags. Um, there, there really isn't a lot that's going on. Well, we had one interesting case where you have the numbers in Iowa, Iowa, which cost a bit more money to call. And we had a reseller that when they started first with us and they were experimenting with our system, they used our calling card platform. And um, can anybody guess what the password was for their first calling card? Well, no, alpha, alpha, alpha numeric. One, two, three, four. Exactly. So it took a little while. So you have these numbers, these 712 numbers. So Verizon and AT&T will let you call these numbers because they're regular numbers. They, they fought in a court. I know I, I'm, I'm friends with one of the telco companies out there. at and is fighting in a court. Verizon just writes it off. T-Mobile will actually go ahead and play. If they get too much traffic to one of these numbers, where it's costing them seven, eight, nine tenths of a cent a minute, and they see, that that's the reason why you have a lot of these free conference calling systems. If they see too much traffic coming to these numbers, T-Mobile will actually go ahead and play a message and tell you, if you call this number, it's gonna cost you a penny a minute. Well, they have these chat lines. By God, I don't understand why anybody calls chat lines anymore, but apparently it's still a thing. And T-Mobile, whoever the provider is that they're using, won't let them call unlimited. So somebody somehow found one of my access numbers, called in and dialed one, two, three, four. They passed around to everybody on the party line that had unlimited, but it was, it was a number I think in, in Boston, but didn't have unlimited on their cell phone to call these numbers, made the phone calls, and because it was a local number, it stayed under the radar. I actually wanted to figure out who was doing it and why they were doing it, so I redirected it to my cell phone, and some gentleman called up, got all freaked out, when some guy picked up instead of his favorite, child, favorite, favorite free calling card platform and told me he didn't know somebody was passing it around on the system, giving out a free number. So in the US, it does happen a little bit. Um, what happens more is international. So for those of you that are from the UK, for the wholesale rate for most mobile providers is a couple of pence a minute, is not a lot of money. Point four. I'm sorry? Point four. Point four for the, for the most part. But you do have the MVNOs, you do have the small carriers that'll charge 
70, 80 pence a minute, which is about a dollar a minute. We haven't seen a lot of flow to the UK, but just as an example, so you can have a widespread of what your costs are. And then what a lot of these guys will do is, is they'll cut a revenue share with the phone company. So it may cost you 70 cents a minute to call the number. By the time it dwindles down to the carrier, they're making 30, 40 cents a minute. And then they're passing along to the fraudsters 10 cents a minute. But it's all legit. And they're all doing it on the up and up. They're doing it because they want to offer billing service because nobody has credit cards, cash, check, or anything else. They have to use their phone to make phone calls. And they get away with it. So before I get into what we want to do, I want to go ahead and do a bit of a quick history lesson as to what's been going on in the past and what people were doing. So real quickly, when Astros first came along, it was a jump for fraudsters. Little aware, there's a little awareness about telecom fraud. So what happened was is that people would set up systems. You know, on Astros, you have a context where different contexts where you could set up how the calls run. They were very good at documenting it, but it's easier just to make the one context when you're first setting up your system. And then you'd go ahead and get a bunch of invites and people randomly trying to take, send you phone calls. In fact, I actually have a PBX system that I haven't touched in years that's still up. And I actually did a quick test earlier just to see if I'm getting random invites. And let's see. This is not a dangerous demo. And yep. As of right now, people are randomly sending me SIP invites. Now, I don't care about this box. This box hasn't been in use in a very long time. But you can see right there how even though this is something that most of the world, for the most part, knows about, and they know to lock it out, you have people actively going ahead and sending you random SIP invites. We actually hear plates from customers saying that at 2 o'clock in the morning, their phones are ringing and they see 100, 101. It's actually these fraudsters sending you invites, sending you phone calls, because they're trying to see if they have a system that's open. So then people got a little wiser. They started sort of locking down their systems, but they're still a bit lazy. And it's very easy to make you know, extension 100, password 100. You will be surprised at how many people today still do it. I have one reseller. No matter how many times I try to educate him on the smart passwords and how to lock down the system, every few weeks keeps getting hit. And his uh, solution is just to delete the trunk and build a new trunk. So we've given up on trying. We, severely locked down his account. So like I said, there are dictionaries out there. We still, still, we still see people trying to attack by going ahead and trying to use you know, lists of usernames and passwords. But for the most part, that's down. It, it does pop up, but not so much. And then along, along came GUIs. Now, web interfaces are awesome. PPBX is very good. I haven't touched it in a while because I'm over system engineers in the, in the background. But it's very good. But the problem that we had with GUIs is everybody wanted a simple solution to go ahead and to run their systems, but nobody had any idea of how the, P, how the um, GUIs were working. In fact, when I first started out and I went to the one IP address once at my ITSP, the small company we started with, I found another system running, well, it was then Astros at home before it turned into free PBX. And while the system had multiple contexts, it has username and password, in theory, it was locked down where you couldn't send it a random call and make a phone call. The GUI was wide open, no username, no password. All I need to do is go ahead and download his credentials that he's using with his carriers, or better yet, just put in my own credentials, send him phone calls. His PBX is going to do what the GUI says, and then they're going to go ahead and it's going to make phone calls. And then we had ID10T development decisions. Does anybody know what ID10T is? So, and you can chalk it up to ID 10 TRs, you can chalk it up to being, you know, lazy, or whatever you want. In the beginning, when a certain very popular GUI was being set up, by default, it would use the same username and password for all installations to MySQL. So all you had to do was go online, find <coughs> FreePBX GUI, and once you saw such a system up there, and if port 3306 was open, it was public knowledge what that username and password was. They could connect in, and they could get it. You'd be surprised at how many people have old systems, and I'll touch on that in, in a bit, where if it's working, they leave it. And these systems are wide open. So what we're currently seeing right now, in general, attackers are going after the lying fruit. 
we're still saying, like I said, everything we, we, I said before was, and you saw my, on my, my, my personal PBX live, how we're still getting all the invites, we're still getting all the, all, all the attacks, but the attackers are gonna go for whatever is easiest for them. They're lazy, they're not interested, they're working too hard. Why are they gonna go in and spend a lot of effort if they can find an easy system to go after? So you're always gonna have vulnerabilities in PBXs and phones, and you better bet once there's an exploit on a device or PBX that's in the wild that people know about that you're using, they're gonna come after you. We have a reseller that's using, has about a thousand Astro phones. The firmware has to be at least five years old because that's when we had the conversation with him and told him he has to update the firmware. And his response was, it's too old. I'm too nervous about upgrading the firmware. If I do, um, could run into issues, I'm gonna leave it as is. Whenever one of these phones end up on a public IP or there's co in that and the packets get forwarded in, he gets lit up like a Christmas tree and he knows it and he's gonna pay for it. Any new phones, he doesn't use these. He's using newer phones, better provisioning, security, blah, blah, blah. But sum it up, if, you, if there are vulnerabilities, and there are always going to be vulnerabilities, and it's a, I keep coming back to this, it's security is a whack-a-mole game. You lock them one way, they're going to come back another way. And you just really have to be on top of things. Another thing, like, like I just alluded to, if it ain't broken, don't fix it. In general, I agree with that theory. You're not going to update your system if you don't have to. But if there is an update, know about it and know why there's an update. If there's an update and it goes in and it says that there is a security breach, there's an issue, and that's why you should upgrade, you may want to test it, you may want to take your time, you may want to do it right, but go ahead and do it because if you don't do it, you're guaranteed to get hit. Brute forcing a web phones on, on the interfaces. So we had an interesting case where we were using, for simplicity again, said reseller that I mentioned earlier that told me to talk about security where they were using just numeric passwords on the phone. So Polycom, I don't know if they have it now, I haven't been involved as much on the provisioning side, where they were allowing as many hits to the phone at once, I believe now because of another resale of ours, they actually changed it where if you try to log in too many times, it will block you. What happened was that the phones were getting compromised. We had no idea how they were getting compromised. I was banging my head against the wall. So the only solution that we had was, was to clean up the phone put it back on the internet, put on syslog, so every single time anything happened on that phone to send to a logging server and watch and see what happens. Sure enough, eventually we start seeing that somebody's hitting the phone and they're sending it all kinds of numbers and they're hitting it and they're hitting it and they're hitting it and they're hitting it and, hitting it, and eventually they have success. Now when they were hitting the phone, we kept quiet and twiddled our thumbs because we knew, okay, they're, get, they're hacking into the phone, they're gonna get the username and password, but now what? So Polycom has a tool we used to, could be still does, where if you can log into the phone, you could download the configuration. Now, on the, on, on the latest firmware releases, if you try to download the configuration, it'll give you all the configuration of the phone, except for the set password. Well, Polycom has another interesting tool where you can upgrade and download the software, the firmware, directly from Polycom's site. And as luck, lucky for the hackers, sorry, for the attackers, um, the earliest firmware version that they allowed you to download the phone to would allow you to get the password in plain text. So looking at the logs, we saw exactly what they did. Brute forced the phone, got in. The first thing they did when they brute forced this was change the password so we had no access to the phone. Then the logs showed that they were downgrading the firmware on the phone. Once they downgraded the firmware on the phone, they went in, view source, and they were in the system. Next, phones on either public IPs, direct or through NAT with default access. Why people don't change passwords on phones by default, I don't know. There's a website called Showdown, which is officially a um, search engine for the Internet of Things, but it's pretty much used by researchers and attackers to find vulnerable systems. I can pretty much guarantee that if you go there and look for Astra and type in HTTP, you will not get past page two if you put in the IP addresses into your browser and try username admin password 22222, you will get in go to the SIP configuration view source, you will have their information. So it's that easy. Now, another thing that, that, that really gets to me is that people assume that NAT is security and they've spoken about this in the past. For the love of God, NAT is not security. NAT, when a packet comes into a, to a NAT device, the way NAT basically works is, is that either if you don't forward, if the, if the router doesn't know where to forward the packet to, it won't send it. So people use this as security. But there's different kinds of NAT. Now, 
Cone that is so basically what happens is that when a packet goes out, because real quickly, because you have multiple IP addresses, the MAT device will go ahead and change the port. So a lot of devices, when the phone first goes out and it's using port 80, it'll use port 80, but if you're using something that's called cone NAT, it'll allow any connection from the internet to go back to the device on port 80. It'll, it'll allow any traffic in. So if you put on a device with default username and password, and they found you through Shodan, within a few minutes they'll be in effect our provisioning system, I'll talk about it in a bit, was compromised and we actually saw the refer URL. The way they got to our provisioning system is they looked for keywords that we have in our system on Shodan. So they actually got us directly from Shodan. Interesting, in California they just recently passed the law where any devices that are sold cannot have a default username and password. I'm normally against government regulation when it comes to this. I like the free market, but this I like. It's going to force manufacturers to where they can't use admin admin or they can't use admin 222 or anything like that. They're going to have to come up with some kind of unique system where every single device can have its own password. I'm already worried about it because the, what they're probably going to do is use the MAC address. And then if you have access to Wi-Fi, you see the MAC address, so it's worthless. But for people on the internet, it's better than nothing. At the very least, I mean, then again, you can, if you know it's a MAC address, you know the manufacturer, you know the range. But again, it, it, it's another layer. I forgot to mention, when it comes to security, it's not any one particular thing that you're going to do that you're going to lock. Because if, for instance, you, you're using, and I'll get into a bit of mutual TLS, and that's locking your system, great. But if there's a vulnerability in Apache, they're still going to get into the system. So it's not a one fix solution, hey, I'm just going to do this. Another problem is, is that you don't necessarily control everything. In our company, we control a lot of the phones, but we don't control all of the phones. So as much as I would lock, and I'll get in a bit, I'd like to lock down the phones, I'd like to lock down the web server, I'd like to lock down everything, I'm limited by what I could do, and I, I can't control every scenario. So you want to try to do as much as possible. So last thing, I've been speaking about this a bit, provisioning system is the holy grail. Most efforts that we've seen have seemed to be coming from here. If you're a small phone company, say you have 10,000 phones, and you, were smart, you, were, you weren't that smart, and you weren't using encryption, you're using mutual TLS or anything like that, and attackers came after you. If they burnt, let's say, 5,000 of your MAC addresses, now realize that once they know your provisioning system, once they know legit MAC addresses, they will keep coming back. Because they know they have a provisioning system and they know this MAC address is valid. One reseller, they refused to change the phone. So even if they're, he changed the password, well, guess where the password was being updated? In the provisioning system. So all the attackers do was revisit the URL if the password was changed and it was, we kill him. Two days later, he was back, and it was you know, a, a vicious cycle. So imagine if you have 5,000 phones that are compromised at $150 each, that's going to cost you three quarters of a million dollars just to go ahead and replace all the phones, besides for the man hours, shipping all the phones, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So bait time. I decided to go ahead and set up a server on a VPS. The top line over there is for Polycom. The other ones are for Yealink just to see what would happen. Again, this is a server that has no DNS on it. I didn't advertise it anywhere. I should not be getting any traffic on it whatsoever. Let the fun begin. All right, so it took about two weeks. You can see the files over here. We're done in August, or how late I was working on my talk. First, we have traffic from an IP over here. And I don't want to mention, these attackers are very, very patient. If they think they have you, They'll sit and wait for a Friday night. If they get you on a Monday morning, they're not going to hit you on a Monday morning. They're going to wait until they know you're not around so they can hit you to when you're sleeping or even if you have alerts or people that are supposed to wake you up, till, till you get to it. They're going to try to make the most money possible. So we have the first, the first hit over here on 000. They get a 200 OK. And notice right here, they're using the Polycom Soundpoint IP as if they're using a Polycom. So I spoke to some people and they're like, well, we use, you know, we, we check against the UA. That's worthless, because you can see over here, the first attempt of the server was from what they claimed to be a Polycom UA. That was the first instance. Then they waited till about 11 o'clock at night. This is from my neighbors in Palestine. They went ahead, you can see over here, they used the Polycom user agent. They here they're using Mozilla. They got a 404, so they switched back to Polycom. Got nothing. They were looking for default Polycom configuration files. This is at 2318. They switch IP addresses and they get a configuration file, and they're in. Followed by, you can start seeing all the requests over here. A little bit of stats on 
what happened. This one IP address, because I did not have fail to ban enabled, they did roughly 14 million requests in 19 hours, which is averages about 200 requests per second to Apache on a VPS with one core. So thank you, DigitalOcean. I guess they have a good infrastructure where there was the box kept up. They were using four IPs, and I wasted 19 hours instead of them hitting somebody else's system. So some people, people may ask, what about fail to ban? Now fail to ban, for who uses here fail, who here uses fail to ban? Okay, fail to ban, for those that don't know, is a very good tool. It's not just for asterisk, it's for all systems. You could adapt it and modify it to work on any system. And what it does is it looks at your logs and anything you define, anything you tell it, it'll go ahead and it'll block it. So we have on our system, if we have more than X amount of 404s, we go ahead and we block you, we don't let you send any traffic. So we've, we've noticed with fail to ban as well, while it's a great tool, and I'm not advising not to use it, because if there is an issue, you get an alert, you'll get an email. Again, the, the, the holy grail is provisioning systems. So if they think that they have a provisioning system and they're actually getting somewhere, and you block them, they'll come back and hit you from another IP. If you're doing geo-blocking, awesome. We, in the beginning, we were getting hit a lot from Palestine. We blocked Palestine. All of a sudden, all the attacks were coming from compromised devices in the United States. So again, like I said, it's, it's a game of whack-a-mole. So there's no one specific tool. Fail to ban is great. But don't rely on it to exclusively lock the attackers. So you may say, but I need provisioning. Because if you have more than five phones, it becomes really hard to manage all these phones, manage all these devices, it's a pain. And I'll be the first one to say, use a provisioning system, but use a damn good provisioning system. So mutual TLS to rescue. Who here knows what mutual TLS is? Oh wow, I didn't know about it until recently. So mutual TLS for those that know is basically when you have a browser and you connect to a, a website, the server has a certificate, it sends back its certificate, you've validated your browser has I want to say about 15 or 15, 20, 30, somewhere in that ballpark, 15 or 30 root certificates that it trusts. It tracks the certificate that you gave it against the root certificate, sees if it matches, if it makes up, if, 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 if it matches up, and if it does, it trusts the server to say who it says it is. Well, what mutual TLS is, is it does the same thing, but it does it in the reverse. So once your phone goes in and connects to the server, and validates and says, hey, I trust the server, I trust the certificate the server is giving me, the server then goes ahead and asks the phone to provide its certificate. So there are multiple vendors. It's not an exhaustive list. These are just ones that I quickly looked at because we're only later on my talk. Polycom, Polycom Yealing, Grand Chino, Obihai, that they all support this where you can download their root certificate. And if anybody wants, after it, send me an email. I'll try to help them say if you want to set this up or anything else that I talked about here for that matter today, where if it's not a Yaling phone, even if they're going, like I said, even they're falsifying the user agent, if you go ahead and you try to, let's see if I could, I'm gonna run out of time, but real quickly if I could, no, my computer's not, I'll do it afterwards, but if I go to a browser and I go to mutual.mydomain.org, it'll throw an error, and if I showed you the Apache logs, it would say that my browser didn't send it a valid certificate. So I said these phones have it. So you're pretty much guaranteed that the device that's coming to you is from that manufacturer. Now, we take it a step further because what we do is, is we're concerned that maybe there's a vulnerability in our code. Maybe that even though I'm locking down my provisioning system, maybe somewhere else, because the provisioning system has all the configurations, maybe they're gonna come in from the IVR interface if it's on the same server. So what we do is, is we have it set up that if there's any request to the server at all, from a MAC address that we know belongs to Yealink, we force it to go to yea.provisioning.mydomain.org. So if let's say they want to do provisioning for a Polycom, and the Polycom link mutual TLS is secure, but they compromise Yealink, and they go to the Yealink URL, it'll force them to use the Polycom URL. So where mutual TLS is supported by the vendor, I'm going to force you to use mutual TLS. I'm not going to let you get away with it. The next thing is, so the gentleman in the back mentioned encryption. Now, not all vendors support encryption. So Polycom, for instance, says, says that they support mutual TLS, but they don't support encrypting, encryption. So providers that like a non-exhaustive list is what I went through. Ashtar, which is now Mitel, Cisco, the uh, SPA, could be other ones as well. 
Grand Stream, Panasonic, and Yalink. Now some of them you make it a bit harder where you actually have to go ahead and install a key on the devices. Other ones they just give you a tool where it encrypts your file, puts out a, a key for you as well, puts it on the server, and only the phones could decrypt these files. And lastly, like I said, guard the provisioning systems with your life because if they get, they, they get through that, your history. So the meat and potatoes of the talk, I hope I don't run out of time. Like I said earlier, use fail to ban. It's, an, it's, it's one of the many tools that are available to you. You want to use that. You want to, again, get the alerts. It's not going to be all end all, but it works. The next thing is don't store password devices in root configuration file. I, I wish I didn't have to say this, but we have resellers that will go ahead and put their, their password that they're using for the web interface on the phone in y000.cfg. So even if you're encrypting the, the, the base files for the specific phones, you're pretty much going to advertise to anybody, hey, if you compromise any of my phones, here's in plain text the password that you could go ahead and use to get into my phones. TLS wherever possible, be it zip, be it provisioning, etc. You want to lock things down as much as possible. As Ole Hansen says, crypto everywhere. For HTTP authenticate, use HTTP authentication provisioning. In addition, get to mutual TLS, encrypting, etc. We have, well, I'll get that in a second actually. And then the next thing is disable what's use unique pass sorry, use unique passwords and SSL certs. Now I say use unique passwords. We have one reseller that encrypts everything, you know, does as much as they possibly can, except they're using FTP, not FTPS, and they're using the same username and password across all their devices to access their provisioning system. All you need is one bad actor to hook up Wireshark, sniff the FTP traffic, get the username and password, download all your phones, you're done. Disable what's not needed. If you're using provisioning, there's no need to have the web interface. I mean, if you can have a phone that's susceptible to somebody hammering away at it, and doing a brute force, do you really need the web interface? It may help, and if you need it, there are cases where we need the web interface. Through provisioning, we enable it because you have to log into the phone. Or if we can't have access to the phone, we'll factory the phone and then go into the web interface. But again, if you don't need something, don't have it enabled. Firewalls, lock everything down and log the violators and actually look at the, rule, look, look at the logs. It's not good enough to lock things down. You want to monitor your system. You want to know what's going on. And you want to, you, you, if this is an abnormality, you want to see it. Now, a lot of people will go ahead and they will only block inbound traffic. Now, the problem is if somebody gets into your network, most devices out there, once you have any kind of session outbound, they'll let everything back in. So if there's a bad actor that gets into your network, they'll be able to wreak havoc. We have one big customer that has a very strict policy when it comes to their firewalls. And every single time we want to do any tr sort of troubleshooting, the firewall team has to go out and open up the firewalls. I hate it, but at the same time, I love it. Because besides for our IP range and a couple of other, other offices, nobody in the organization can get out and do anything at all. The next thing is, <coughs> know the fundamentals of networking and network security. And as PBX people, you may say it's not my job. If you're working in an organization where you have a firewall team, you have a networking team, if there's a problem and the firewall guys screw up, they may get in trouble for it, but you bet that if there's something, if there's a problem where they get past your firewall and they get into your PBX, your boss or your clients are coming after you for answers. So it also helps to know a lot about networking for when there's problems, for when there's issues. Um, we had a customer recently that had a problem where the MTU was larger than 1,500 bytes. Even the vendor couldn't figure it out. And after looking at PCAPs just from somebody coming from a, an engineering networking background, within two seconds looking at the PCAP, because the software developers, they're just software developers. They keep looking in code. But as a networking person, I looked at the packet. I saw it was more than 1,500 bytes. And I knew instantly it was an issue. Real quick joke, how many um, software developers does it take to change a light bulb? Zero, it's a hardware issue. So. I don't mean to pick on software developers, but they like thinking everything is software and anything else is not their headache. VPNs are awesome. I love them because, again, they're encrypting everything. And another point, I've yet to find a device that has SIP, uh, SIP ALG setting when it comes to NAT where it actually helps. So if you have customers that have issues with their devices, if you're running something called Open, you're running Open VPN on the, again, there's a quick, dirty list of phones that support it. Yaling, Grand Stream, Snom, Digimon, Sangoma where it'll actually go ahead and create a tunnel 
back to your server. So you can have rules in your PBX where if traffic is coming in from any public IP, I'll, let you, I'll point you to this context, I'll let you make these calls. If traffic is coming in from an internal IP from the VPN, then I know it's a client coming in with a signed certificate, I can give it a bit more trust. One more thing when it comes to NAT and security is that right now, again, people rely on NAT for security. But as IPv6 is out there more and more, anybody here that has Verizon, I know it's a Blackberry, but it still has IPv6, and it works pretty much every device today is on a public, is on the public internet. So if you don't know the basic about, basics about networking and security, and they get in and you by accident have a phone with default username and password, even if you're just testing, and you say, hey, I'm gonna do the password later, once they get in, you're done. Next, telephony. I'm gonna try to wrap this up real quickly. Blacklists, so whenever we do get hit, we have lists, naughty lists of um, when calls go on. So if we get hit or if a customer gets hit, we take the number that they were called, we add it to a list. If anybody here wants it, I'll give it after I vet you, because unfortunately there are bad actors that show up to conferences, and I'm not gonna give my list, which we've built up over time to people, but depending on the right people, I will give you my list. So if on our system, if you hit my naughty list, we have two lists. We have a naughty list, which we pretty much know it's fraud, and then we have lists where we're pretty certain it's fraud. So if we're pretty certain, we do some investigation. We may call the client. If we're almost certain it's fraud, and if you see one of these numbers are called and you're looking like VoIP monitor, uh, network, uh, voice monitoring tool, and you all of a sudden see calls to everywhere and it's not the customer's profile, you're pretty much certain that it's fraud. The same thing when Nir has a blog post, Nir Simonovich has a blog post on this when it comes to toll free, where people will go ahead and call your toll free numbers, have, an, have a contract with the phone company where they're getting recipient. So you want to look for bad actors. Only allow traffic where the traffic is expected. Does poor Sally in accounting need to call Cuba? Is she calling Cuba all the time? If not, don't give her access. If your carrier has a setting to block expensive traffic, do it there as well. Like I said, if you're only calling in the United States, lock everything else. If you have a setting anything costs more than 10 cents, lock it. I would rather people call me up and yell at me that they can't make a phone call than the boss firing me because I left the system wide open. Channel limits in place. Again, if you have a phone in the lobby that's made for internal calls, does it have to make external calls? Poor Sally in accounting, does she have to make more than one phone call at a time? Is she really making conferencing calls? If not, limit her to one phone call at a time. Use an SPC, use something in the front like Camellia or Open Sips that's gonna go ahead and watch all the traffic coming into your system if you're a phone company or if you have a PBX and you have people registering from the outside. Daily call limits, even if you have a regular hosted PBX in your organization and you don't care about the pricing, do set up something like A2 billing or some kind of CG rates something which will monitor your costs. So if all of a sudden you have a higher than normal cost because you could be using more than one vendor. You could be using multiple phone providers and they could be calling one destination for a couple of dollars and another destination and you won't know about it. So know how much money it's costing you so you could then go in and say, hey, I've unexpected traffic. I, you, you, what you're looking to do is monitor everything and look for abnormalities. So what's normal for me may be not normal for you. Compare CDR costs to what your carrier has, so do reconciliations. So if your carrier says that the, the price is 10 cents a minute, and all of a sudden you get the bill and it's out of sync, you could say, well, the bill says it's 25 cents a minute, and I'm looking at my CDRs and the rates that you sent me, and it should be 10 cents a minute. We've had that with carriers. I don't know if it was on purpose or by accident, but it happens. The next thing, like I said, I alluded to earlier, secure system function functionality. We had an hour system in the beginning where smart people decided to set their password to voicemail to one, two, three, four. Now, Asterisk has an option where if you call into the voicemail system, you can make phone calls out. So any customer that had a mailbox with the password 1234, they called into the phone system, and they entered 1234, and they were calling wherever. Call forwarding is another example. They don't have to have any access to SIP or attacking the PBX, but they would call in, do call forwarding, then they'd call your regular number, which would forward to an international destination. So they don't really compromise the system. They just set up call forwarding, and now it's costing you money. Can't stress this enough, lock down your phones. We had a case where, again, we had CONAT real quickly. They were sending a crafty invite to the phone. The phone would auto answer. They'd send it a transfer. They'd make a phone call out. It took me two days, and I'm very proud that I actually found it because, it was, again, I was trying to figure out, oh, well, that's the next slide. When you're compromised, investigate it. There's no shame in, 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 in being compromised. The shame is if 
Well, the shame is being compromised twice by the same vector, but if you do get hit, there's, 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 no, there's no embarrassment. It happens to all of us and keeps happening to us, whether it's ID 10 t errors or laziness, whatever it is, but you want to find how they're coming in and you want to make sure they don't hit you again. So as soon as we found that they were doing crafty invites because the phones were wide open, because Yealink by default, at least at the time, was shipping their phones where it took any invite from any device and answered, I wrote a script that went found every single Yealink on our network, sent everybody an invite, and any phone that accepted said invite sent them an email, hey, go ahead and change your configuration. We're we'll cooking because I have three minutes left. Best practices, log anything and everything that your system allows. And if your vendor does not allow you to log it, yell at them and make them give you the ability to log it. Because if your system gets compromised, I was speaking to the gentleman earlier, you have no idea. Did they get through the web? Did they get through you from an easy username and password? Is it a vulnerability? You have no idea how they got it. Be on top of route changes. In, again, in the US, it's not such a big deal, but internationally, it's a big deal where one day a route will be a landline, it'll cost you two cents a minute. Tomorrow, they'll change it to be a mobile number, it's gonna cost you 30 cents a minute. You'll get exploited by clients. There's another vendor over here who told me about a case where he had a customer that didn't update their routes right away and I think they lost $50,000. Subscribe to your vendor's newsletters, keep up with the latest vulnerabilities because the attackers are. So we had customers that were getting lit up from a Cisco vulnerability and when I Googled it, I noticed that when it started happening was three days after Cisco publicly disclosed there was a problem to update the firmware. So, if Cisco is sending out an email saying there's a problem, pay attention to it. Like I said, monitor, look for abnormalities. Another one real quickly, if you don't know your client, start off with limited access. We had a case where we allowed auto signups when the company first started. It was a holiday weekend for two days. We had a lot of signups. We loved it, but it turned out they were using hacked PayPal accounts and they were turning around and selling that termination. As soon as that happened, we vet clients. We only let specific clients in and we build a relationship and then we let you send more. A lot of the worst stories that I've written down over here but I have one minute left. And last thing is one primary contact for a company and having a contract. And the reason why I say that is you have a company with multiple owners and it's happened to us more than once where there's a fight, you end up in the middle, both of them want to port out the number and then if there's a court case and a lawsuit, guess whose name is going to be on there. So you want to stay away from that. If you want to hear more war stories and more fun, let me know. That's it. And in the next 30 seconds, you have a question, let me know where you can speak to me afterwards because I think I have about 20 seconds up. It's actually 4.30 right now. So any questions? Well, we don't really have uh, any, any, any time for questions because um, um, you timed out. But that was brilliant. That was hugely comprehensive.